Welcome to the world of probiotic foods. This is Cultured Food Life with your host, Donna Schwenk. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining me today and for listening to my podcast. It means a lot to me that you take time out of your busy day to spend a little bit of it with me, and I hope that this will help you a lot because this is something, um, a topic I'm, I get a lot of questions about. There's a bunch of of different things that I get asked all the time about fermenting, about what to do, and I'm going to give you my take on it and uh, try to help you, try to help it make it easier for you. I've been doing this a long time, and I'm really good at it, and I know all the ins and outs, and hopefully I can shed some light on some things that maybe you're confused about. So years ago, when I was young and raising my kids, you know, I was often really influenced by well-meaning friends and family, and they would just scare me to death with the latest news that they would hear. And they would say, don't eat this. Don't let your kids do that. And uh, did you read the story about how bad this is for you? And it just drove me crazy trying to figure out what to believe. And finally, one day, I had just had enough. Um, I decided that they didn't know any better than me, and I decided I was going to, you know, follow my own path, seek my own guidance from within, and forget what everybody else thought and find out what was right for me. And the truth of the matter is that bad news sells faster than good news, and that's really disheartening to me, but it's true. So I was bound to determine when I started my website to make my site and my blog and my podcast about the wonderful things you should do and not the scary things you shouldn't do, which half the time, guys, is speculation anyway. They don't really know. So instead of being tossed around this way and that, I figured out myself and, you know, what was best for me. And without a doubt, my methods worked better. They were faster and more efficient. And I'm going to share this with you, the things that I've learned that you won't often hear from anybody else. I've been doing this a really, really long time, and very well-meaning people often state things that they haven't tried or they haven't researched, and they try to sell products or write interesting blogs or books, and it's really easy to jump on the bandwagon and write about things you don't know about because it's really popular and it drives traffic to your blog, Um, but I have lived this stuff day in and day out with these cultures, making them every single day for over 17 years. And they impart wisdom to you when you spend that much time with them. They're living organisms. They're alive. They're constantly developing and changing and adapting. And, um, you know, I really want to show you tips from somebody who really loves this stuff, who lives it who believes in it and has experienced enormous health benefits from it and has helped thousands of others do the same. So I have a huge desire to help you learn it and to learn it well and to not be afraid. And, um, you know, always, always, guys, trust your own guidance over anyone else, even me. It's how you discover things you never thought were possible. And it's just really fun to live this way. Because as you do that, you'll find you're smarter than you know, you'll find you have your own guidance, and that you don't have to be tossed about in the wind about what what to do or what not to do, because you'll find that you have your own wisdom um, that is specific for you. So here we go. Let me tell you about, I think I've got like, hang on just a second, 13 tips, I believe. And I want to talk to you about them. And these are ones you ask me all the time. So these are tips that nobody else talks about but me. Okay, so number one, do you put a cloth or lid on your ferments? So many people ask me this about kefir, they ask me about kombucha, and they ask me about cultured vegetables. Do you put cloth lids on them or do you put secure jar lids on them? Now, I put lids on all my ferments except for kombucha and water kefir. Kombucha and water kefir need a cloth and a rubber band. And I know a lot of people um, have been out there saying that you should put a rubber band on your milk kefir, um, and that be it non-dairy or dairy. But what I have learned through 17 years of experience is that people have a lot of problems when they use a cloth and a rubber band on milk kefir or non-dairy kefir. You need to learn, use a, 
use a secure lid, um, whether it's plastic or metal. Make sure if it's used, if you're using a metal to not make sure that the keeper's not touching that lid. Um, but it needs to be secure to keep out fruit flies. But also people have problems with cross-contamination with wild yeast in the air. And it eliminates all of this if you put a lid on it. Um, I get a lot of emails, people saying, oh, my kefir turned, got a pink fuzz on it. Or it's got this white fuzzy stuff on it. And often it is just cross-contaminating with something else you've got in your kitchen. But if you put a lid on it, it won't do that. Um, kefir cultured vegetables, they all need secure lids. You can use an airlock lid with cultured veggies. But kombucha and water keeper always use a rubber band and a cloth. So you put the rubber band around the cloth so to keep the fruit flies out. But that one is, uh, it needs air to ferment properly. But kefir and cultured vegetables do not. So always use a lid, no, even if they tell you not to, because I'm telling you, it'll eliminate a lot of problems if you do. Okay, number two, you don't need to use weights on your cultured vegetables. Okay, in the past... I used to try to use weights to hold down my vegetables. And I did it for years. I really hated it too, by the way. It drove me crazy. And then I started to do it without weights and it worked just as well. And I've just done, good Lord, I've done so many ferments with cultured vegetables and with weights and without weights. And for the last, I would say, 15 years, I have not used weights. And yes, the veggies can climb up above the water and you can open the jar and push them down or just leave them the way they are. And they usually do fine. If the veggies turn brown because they're exposed to air, then just remove them. Um, if they if they get this harmless yeast, comma yeast on them, um, it's harmless. It's white. Uh, I just remove it, scrape it off, and that usually develops if the veggies aren't fresh or if you if your culture isn't strong enough that you're using in the jar. If you're just using like salt, then you probably need a strong culture in there because it's not fermenting properly, and. Um, Airlock lids work great. They help keep that that comma yeast at bay. And so does adding a culture package like cutting edge cultures or even kefir whey. You want to use something that has a lot of culture that gives you lots of bacteria in it so that it keeps all the other things from proliferating through your vegetables. And it doesn't, it's harmless. It doesn't hurt you, this yeast that's on top of there. It's kind of a, a white powdery thing, but it does make your veggies taste bad and you won't like them. And if you leave it on there, it, it will get worse and then it will really change the taste of your ferments and you won't like it. So you can skip the weights and I'm giving you permission to do so because they never really work that great anyway. And then you have to wash them and dig them out. It drove me crazy. And it was such a hassle and it really didn't help that much anyway. Some people will take cabbage leaves and try to put them on top, but then they get exposed to the air and it kind of gets a horrible flavor and then they don't ferment properly because those are above the water and they, I don't know, that has never worked for me either. So um, I just let them do their thing and I just really don't bother it. I just don't worry about it unless I see something and they work great. But I always use a starter culture. I always use cutting edge culture or a vegetable starter culture or kefir whey. I, I haven't used kefir whey in oh my gosh, over a decade, because I just use the cutting edge culture because then I don't have any problems, which is a veggie culture. And the cool thing about that is that when you make a batch, you can use the brine to make another batch. So it's very economical. And it just makes it just makes everything easier. That's why I do it. You don't have to use it. You can just use salt. But then that's often when people get into trouble because there's not enough good bacteria in there to really get it to culture correctly. And so then you develop that yeast, which once again is harmless, but can make your veggies taste bad. So always scrape it off. Okay. Number three, use any kind of jar to make cultured vegetables. Okay. So this particular topic gets me kind of riled up when people say you have to use an airlock jar to make cultured veggies or you're going to harm yourself. Not too long ago, it was, I don't remember how many years ago it was. Somebody put out a blog and said that if you don't use an airlock lid, you're going to harm yourself. It's not going to proper ferment proper, uh, ferment properly. And if one particular person who was selling these airlock lids would really scare people. And I got a lot of emails. I even got phone calls from my friends asking me about it because they really scared them. Now this makes for a sensational blog. 
That drives traffic to your website. It scares people when you do stuff like that. And whenever in doubt, follow the money. Now, I sell airlock lids too. But in no means am I going to tell you that you have to use an airlock lid. You know, they made cultured vegetables for thousands of years without airlock lids, and they did fine. And this is how many, you know, generations upon generations kept their food safe, made cultured veggies. They would put them in jars. They didn't have airlock lids, you know, hundreds of years ago. They didn't have that. They just cultured vegetables just like we do today, and they did great. So if somebody tells you that you have to have an airlock lid and, uh, and they're pretty aggressive about it, you know, don't believe them. Don't listen to them because um, it's expensive to do that if you have to buy all these airlock lid jars. And I just sell the little airlocks and I like them. I think they work great. I think they work even better than putting in a jar. But you can also just make it in a jar. You don't have to have the airlock. It's still going to work. It's still going to be great. And... I don't want you to be afraid. You don't need one. If so, if somebody tells you you've got to have one, you're going to make yourself sick. Well, don't listen to them because I've been doing this 17 years. And if anybody was going to die, it was going to be me. Okay. So, and fermentation is one of the safest ways to pre- preserve your vegetables. And that's not me saying that. I have just did a blog post on there, or actually did a podcast on this. Can cultured foods hurt you? And you should listen to that because there's a lot of science behind that. And um, whenever you submerge, submerge vegetables underwater. They make their own special bacteria that just dominates and grows and keeps out pathogens and makes the vegetables very, very safe, even safer than raw foods. So you can use any kind of jar, be it glass. It needs to be glass or food grade. I don't recommend using food grade plastic, although you can do it. You can do them in those big buckets that are, I think it's five grade food plastic, but I really think glass is the best. You can use a crock, make sure it's not got lead, you know, any kind of lead in the paint. Um, you can use a crock. Um, I like jars the best. They're easy. They're inexpensive to to use, and you can use them again and again, and they're easy to find everywhere. Okay, number four. Don't put your ferments in a cupboard. Uh, kombucha is the one that this cultured rule applies to most. Kombucha needs air to ferment, and if it doesn't have enough air circulation, it can cause problems with mold, and I've seen this a lot. So putting it in a closed cabinet doesn't give the air circulation that it needs. Plus, you just never know what kind of bacteria has been living in your cabinet. And remember, your homes are filled with bacteria everywhere. And so it's best leave your kombucha out on the counter, keep it away from direct sunlight, and it will do really great. But if it does happen to get in direct sunlight, it's not going to kill it. Just kind of move it to the corner so that it's not in direct sunlight. This goes for kefir and culture vegetables as well. But because you have a lid on kefir and cultured vegetables, keeping in the, in them in a cupboard doesn't affect them as much. Um, but it's best to keep them out of direct sunlight. I like to put them on my counter so I don't forget about them. Again, it won't kill them if they do get in direct sunlight, but it's best to not do that. Um, I like to look at my cultured foods, and I think they're just beautiful fermenting on the counter. I think it's important that you look at them all the time while they're fermenting. Then you can watch and see how they're doing. And you'll be rem- you'll be reminded to take care of them and to put them in the fridge when they're done. So I like to watch them do their job as they transform my food into probiotics. And uh, they kind of have a place of honor on my kitchen counters. And I don't really like putting them in a cupboard. Okay, number five. Don't ferment too long. It's not better. And let's let's start with kefir, okay? So some people think that letting your cultures ferment longer is better. And that is not necessarily true. Um, Some people will let their kefir ferment for 48, even longer than 48 hours, but it is best to to get your kefir to ferment in 24 hours. Now, um, if your kitchen is warmer, it's going to go faster. If it's colder, it's going to take longer. So it really depends on your kitchen, but here's the test. If it tastes sour and tart, then it's done. And if it's starting to get those little tiny pockets of whey, just, just barely starting, then you know it's done. And when you see that, put it in your fridge because that, or and strain your grains out first if you have grains. Or if you're making easy kefir, which doesn't require grains, you can just place it in your fridge. So if you let it go for 48 hours, some people like to do this, it diminishes the probiotics as the bacteria run out of food to eat and then they start to die. The only time there's an exception is when you second ferment your kefir. 
And this is when you're placing fruit in your kefir after it's done its first ferment, which was 24 hours. And then you decide you're going to second ferment it for another couple hours and you put a piece of fruit or lemon peel or orange peel or a strawberry in it. And then that gives the bacteria something new to eat. So it starts to create more probiotics. That is the only time you should really let it go longer than 24 hours. And as it does that, as it starts to continue to eat the fruit out of that, it really, it skyrockets the folic acid in it. The B vitamins go up through the roof because you're giving bacteria something to eat. So the longer you let something ferment, um, the more diminished the probiotics will be because those, the bacteria starts to run out of food. Now, with kombucha, kombucha should be fermented until it's not sweet anymore. But you don't want it to turn to vinegar because you want it to just be tart. And when it reaches that stage where it's like vinegar, then much of the good yeast and bacteria have died and you won't receive as many benefits. You can use it like vinegar. You can bottle it and stick it in your cabinet and it'll be perfectly preserved, tasting like uh, vinegar and use it in any recipe. So that's a good way if you do happen to let it over ferment. Also, if you over ferment your kombucha, you will not be able to second ferment it with fruit because the good yeast will have died and they won't be there to ferment it again. So just let it get till it's tart. Don't let it get over fermented so it's super, super sour and vinegary. And then you'll know you're getting the most probiotics and you're getting the most benefits that you can get. Okay, number seven, don't ferment your cultured vegetables too long. Now, there are a lot of people who are going to tell you that you can take your crop for three to six weeks to get the most benefit and to not use a starter culture since this is how it was done for thousands of years. A lot of people say that. I get a lot of questions about that too. Although I don't disagree, it was a great method, but they did this for years. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, I found that to let it just ferment for six days, I got more benefits from it. It had more probiotics and, um, you know, longer you let anything ferment, the more the product, the bacteria runs out of food. So the less probiotics you will get. And unfortunately, fermenting it for weeks on end diminishes the probiotics. And a lot of times you get into the common yeast problem, which can kind of overtake your mix. And that's when people began to get into problems. And so I've always done it for six days, which I think has the best flavor. It allows it to stay stronger, longer with the amount of probiotics. And I have people get mad at me when I tell them to ferment it for only six or seven days. They do. They get really mad at me. And I get people mad at me telling me to use a culture. Well, because they think that I'm just doing it to make money. Well, it's true. I do sell a culture and I do benefit from that. But I also am telling you that because it works. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't want you to spend six weeks making something and get less probiotics from it and then have problems with comma yeast. This is just what I use. But you can do whatever you want. You can just use salt. You don't have to use a culture package, and you can uh, let it ferment for however long you want, but this is the method that has worked best for me. And um, the reason I, I know that it's, that it's better for this way is because I had a microbiologist who came to one of my classes who I had to know really well, and she tested ones that had been, you know, used to culture versus one that just used salt. And then she, she tested one that had gone six weeks and one that had gone six week, uh, six days. And uh, the ones that they had tested past the six-day mark into the six weeks didn't have any more of the probiotics in it like the ones that were only fermented for six days. And so um, we also did that on our cutting-edge culture product. Uh, we had a PhD peer review done on it, and what I had suspected was true. If you just use salt and not a cutting edge culture package and you let it go for too long, the um, probiotics greatly diminish in it. It's on the back of the boxes too. You can see that review and that PhD, PhD peer review that would uh, show you um, the specifics of what actually happened. So the sooner you eat them, the more benefits you receive. Um, they do stay preserved in your fridge for a long time because you've cooled them down. If you leave them out for six weeks just fermenting on your counter, um, you're keeping at room temperature, they're going to ferment very, very fast. As as opposed to letting them ferment for six days on your counter and then placing in the fridge, it slows it way down, it protects the probiotics in there, and it makes them taste great. So that's my personal opinion. You do what you think is best. Okay, number eight. Okay, this is a pet peeve of mine. Don't wash your kefir grains in water. I don't know. This is something that is like my pet peeve. Never ever do it because it washes off the protective coating of bacteria and yeast and it harms the kefir grains. And I see this over and over and over again. 
Um, it's It just diminishes the good bacteria and yeast. They won't be as strong. A lot of people's um, kefir grains quit making kefir because they've washed them so much. And uh, I just seen that they really don't need it. They need that coating on them. It's not a good idea to wash them. Um, they need that protective coating. It's like going outside naked with no clothes on. You need it needs it needs something to protect itself. And so this is uh, I call, they called me the kefir police, okay? Because I get so worried when people do this because it it does harm them and it does in many cases many many cases it kills them. If you've only washed them once, usually they're okay. Twice, usually they're okay. Maybe. It just depends, but I get in a lot of emails about that. So just don't wash them. If you need to clean, if you want to wash them or if it bugs you or something, wash them in milk or almond milk or whatever you use, what medium you're using to make the kefir. Just don't wash them in water. Okay, number nine, you can use a stainless steel strainer. Metal is something that tends to react with cultured foods and especially with kombucha. And keeping metal away from kombucha um, is important because it will mostly certainly, kombucha will break it down. And just as kombucha removes heavy metals from your body, it does the same thing with metals in any regard. So keep metal away from kombucha. That's important. However, when it comes to kefir, a stainless steel strainer or spoon is actually okay. People panic when I tell them this, but um, I, you know, a lot of people say never, never use uh, stainless steel. Stainless steel is different than other metal, and it's not it. It doesn't get as corrosive. It doesn't cause the problem. Plus, you're not leaving it on there. Um, I've used a stainless steel strainer for 17 years, and it's worked great. And so I just don't leave it on on anything. And stainless steel actually can even work for kombucha, too. But I don't really recommend doing it long term. But it doesn't get corrosive, and it doesn't break down. So that some people do use that. Um, using a metal spoon is okay, so there's no need to worry. Kefir does not have some of the kind of properties that kombucha de- has uh, and using metal to strain your kefir or eat your kefir with is absol- is that actually very is fine and won't hurt it or hurt you. Okay, number 10. Can cultured veggies be fermented with metal lids? Yes, you can. You can use a metal lid, but it's best to leave a lot of room in the jar so that the veggies aren't expanding and touching the lid. Over time, the ferments will start to break down that metal lid. But it takes quite a long time for that to happen. So it's best to not have them in constant contact with them. I like the plastic lids for fermenting. um, But if metal's all you have, just leave extra room so they can expand and ferment and you'll be fine. Do it all the time. Okay, number 11. Second, ferment your kefir for more probiotics. Nothing makes your kefir taste better than adding a small piece of fruit to your kefir and second fermenting it. Like a strip of orange peel, just take a little small peel off your orange or your lemon. It increases the B vitamins, especially the folic acid. It mellows out the taste of that sour taste and makes it taste so much better. And this is all accomplished by adding fruit, which is a prebiotic for those hungry microbes that are in kefir. And they gobble up the sugar in the fruit and make more probiotics for you. So, but don't let it ferment, second ferment for too long. And don't add too much fruit as the taste can get overly acidic. Don't add a bunch of fruit in there. Just add like one piece or one strip of something. And I will put a link in the description below on an article for more information about that. And I've got lots of information on my Bot It Pro page, which is a membership site where we give away free ebooks every month, different ones every month. We have, oh my gosh, we have so many courses and lessons and live chats and you get discounts and we have extra special recipes and we've got extra stuff for if you want more information on second fermenting. I have some for everybody too, but I have even more for my members. Okay, number 12. The terrain is everything. Okay, so I've been doing this a long time and the greatest thing I have learned is how important it is to add prebiotics to feed the microbes in your inner ecosystem. The French biologist Louis Pasteur was a microbiologist and a chemist known for his discovery on microbial fermentation and pasteurization. And he believed we should destroy germs, bacteria, and viruses that invade the body. But this theory created a dependence on big pharma and antibiotics, you know, which, you know, we have seen. We can overuse it and do more harm to us and create superbugs. So I'm not completely against antibiotics because in many cases they can be life-saving. But by all means, you should really try to rebuild the 
multifaceted inner you know, system that lives inside of you that houses our microbial community um, after the use of antibiotics. You need to rebuild that. And the inner terrain is comprised of microbes and yeast and microorganisms and your immune system. And it's more important for remaining disease-free than searching for new antibiotics to kill bacteria and viruses. And prebiotics are fruits and vegetables. I've written so many blogs about this um, on how prebiotics are important as probiotics because they feed those microbes and allow them to grow. And I'm not just saying this because I've really lived it. And I can feel my body fighting off viruses when my immune system is strong. I'll feel a little more tired that day and um, I'll get little signals that my immune system's on the move. And then I just, then it goes away. It goes away very quickly because it's a constant reminder how wonderfully we are created. Usually within a day, um, I'm back to normal. I don't get the virus or the flu or whatever is going around. My body fights it off. But that is because I constantly feed those microbes probiotics and prebiotics. And I also thank my body every day for what it does for me. When I go to the market, I look for foods to feed those 100 trillion inhabitants that call me home. And uh, those probiotic food strains that are transient bacteria that don't live in me for very long, so I take them on a regular basis, be it cultured vegetables or kefir kombucha. And then I feed them nuts and seeds and fruits and vegetables and allow them to build a fortress inside of me. And then I have this like mighty terrain that uh, can take on the world and I'm not afraid of getting sick or worried about disease because my body has really showed me how to take care of it in a very spectacular way. So number 13, no two ferments are the same. Your home and mine are very unique and different and they house the bacteria that you carry around. You're a cloud of trillions of microbes that go with you everywhere. And it's really crazy to think about it, but a hundred trillion microbes is a lot for one person, but that's what you are. And they're starting to use this in forensic work to determine who's been in the room at the scene of a crime. And that being said, you are a powerful influence on those around you by creating a healthy and diverse ecosystem in your gut. And this will affect your cultured foods too. The more you make cultured foods, the better your ferments will work because you're infusing your home with this powerful good bacteria. Your home is an expression of you and so are your cultured foods. They will change with the temperature and often how you use, how often you use them and make them. Um, they love to ferment and the more you make them and the more cultured foods, the better they will perform. It's the same inside of you. It gets better and better the more you pay attention to what you're eating and how you're living and the emotions you feel. You signal your body to create disease and wellness with everything you eat, with everything you think, with everything you do. And the more wellness that ensues, the more you spread this tether. And quite literally, by the bacteria you carry around you, you change the world that you live in. So guys, just make these foods as often as you can and consume them daily like I do. They will change you and get better with time, just like you. And I hope these tips will help you and make you feel good about culturing your food. I try to make this as easy as possible so you'll do it and receive the benefits. Because if it's hard, you're not going to do it. You're going to be scared. So don't be afraid of messing it up. Cultured foods are some of the safest foods to eat and make on this planet. And I really decided to dedicate the rest of my life to helping you so that you can get better and change your life with something as simple as these living foods that have probiotics in them. If you're still nervous, then go check out my podcast that said, Can Culture Foods Hurt You? And I hope that you'll, uh, I hope you'll make these foods. I hope you'll love these foods. And I hope you'll love the process. And if you struggle, I'm here. I have so much information on my website at culturedfoodlife.com. I have podcasts. I have videos. I have books. I've... I've done everything I know to do um, because I really love it. And when you love something and you live it and you believe in the benefits, the people who are seeking what you have will find you. And that's what I hope is happening here. I'm here if you need me. Check out the website. Check out more blog posts. Check out more podcasts. Um, everything you need to make cultured foods is free on my site. I make sure that everybody can do it because I love it so much 
I know how much it can help you. Check out my Lives Touch page for lots of stories and testimonies. I get them all the time. I got three last week that made me cry. And uh, it even helped a dog that was struggling with cancer. It was so meaningful to me. Um, And it makes my life sheer joy because out of my sickness and out of my struggle, I came so much wealth of knowledge for myself that healed myself and my family and now is helping other people, even our precious furry animals. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm so grateful that you, my friend, take time out of your busy day to listen to me. Have a great day. I hope you'll tune in next Tuesday or subscribe to my button and you'll get those uh, podcasts weekly. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you. Have a great one.